quiet out here. The seagulls. The sun is warm, but it's not too humid. It's actually kind of a great day for fishing. That's why it sticks. <laughs> yeah, what does it smell like? It smells like dead fish. It smells like the water. What is going through your head right now? I don't know, thinking about what they've, they went through. <clears throat> I don't know, I just wonder a lot what it was, what it was like. They say our people were born on the water. When it occurred, no one can say for certain. Perhaps it was in the second week or the third, but surely by the fourth, when they had not seen their land or any land for so many days that they lost count. It was after the fear had turned to despair and the despair to resignation and the resignation gave way, finally, to resolve. They knew then that they would not hug their grandmothers again, or share a laugh with a cousin during his nuptials, or sing their baby softly to sleep with the same lullabies that their mothers had once sung to them. The teal eternity of the Atlantic Ocean had severed them so completely that it was as if nothing had ever existed before, that everything they ever knew had simply vanished from the earth. Some could not bear the realization. They heaved themselves over the walls of wooden ships to swim one last time with the ancestors. Others refused to eat, mouths clamped shut until their hearts gave out. But in the suffocating hull of a ship called the White Lion, bound for where they did not know, those who refused to die understood that the men and women chained next to them in the dark were no longer strangers. They had been forged in trauma. They had been made black by those who believed themselves to be white. And where they were headed, Black equals slave. So these were their people now. What happened here? Um, I mean, we really don't know a lot. A pirate ship by the name of White Lion sails into the bay here and they needed to trade something of value so that they could get supplies to make the rest of their journey and what they traded were 20 to 30 Africans and this would be at this place um, kind of ironically called Point Comfort where slavery in the British North American colonies that would go on to become the United States begins. So. From the New York Times Magazine, I'm Nicole Hannah-Jones. This is 1619.
want me to send you the raspberry or the whatever they call it like that. Now, it? Um, that's your happy Valentine's Day, Nicole. This is a tape for Nicole. Hello, Dolly. How you doing? Excuse me while I partake of this cancer stick. <laughs> that's okay. When I was a child, my dad always flew a flag in our front yard. Our house is on a corner lot, and in the front yard, right in the corner, was this, I couldn't tell you how tall it was. It always seemed really garishly tall to me at the time. Uh, There was this very tall aluminum flagpole. My parents didn't make a lot of money, so our house always had paint chipping, and there was always something about the house that was in disarray. You know, the grass was looking disheveled, or the railing on the stairs was falling off, but the flag was always pristine. As soon as it started to show even the slightest tatter, my dad would replace the flag with a fresh new flag. He would never allow a tatter flag to fly. And I didn't understand it. I I didn't know other Black kids whose parents were flying a flag in their front yard. I knew lots of white people who flew flags. Lots of white people who flew flags. My dad was born on a sharecropping farm in Greenwood, Mississippi, where his family picked cotton in the same cotton fields that enslaved people had picked cotton not too long before. That county, LaFleur County in Mississippi, lynched more Black people than any other county in Mississippi, and Mississippi lynched more Black people than any other state in the country. So it was a pretty devastatingly violent and hard place to live. My dad's mom fled the South like millions of other Black people during the Great Migration and came north to Waterloo and found many of the same barriers that she had sought to escape. She was forced to buy a house on the Black side of town. Most jobs were unavailable to her, so she cleaned white people's houses. My father went to segregated schools. And at a young age, my father joined the military so that he could get his way out of poverty, but also for the reasons that so many Black people joined the military, which is he hoped that if he served his country, his country might finally see him as an American. He loved being in the Army. He was stationed in Germany, picked up German very quickly. He was so smart. He loved talking about that time. It was a period where he got to see things that a poor Black child born in Mississippi would not normally get to see. But the military didn't end up being a way out for my dad for long. Um, He was passed up for opportunities, and the only jobs my dad ever worked were service jobs. He worked as a convenience store clerk or a bus driver. And because of that, this big, pristine American flag flying in the front of our yard was deeply embarrassing to me. And I didn't understand why he would feel that much love for a country that clearly did not love him. I felt this way all through high school. I was no longer standing for the national anthem. I had stopped saying the Pledge of Allegiance. And really, throughout most of my adult life, I mean, clearly I know I'm an American. I was born here. Every family member for generations back that I know were all born here. But I never felt like I could claim fully that I was an American. But it wasn't until I really started researching and reading and thinking about this project that my own thinking started to shift. That I realized my dad understood things that I never knew. I now understand for the first time why my dad was so proud to fly that flag.
My name is Fountain Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. Now in my boy days, we were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows and hogs and all like that. Have an auction bench, put you up on the bench and bid on you, the same as you're bidding on cattle, you know. But still, I don't like talk about it because it makes, makes people feel bad, you know. So you kind of have to put yourself in the scene. It is June of 1776, and Thomas Jefferson, at the very young age of 33 years old, has been tasked with drafting the document that is going to declare to the world why the British North American colonies, the 13 colonies, want to break off from the British Empire. He goes to Philadelphia and rents two rooms on the edge of town along the river and sits down to draft what we all know now as the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers... So he's sitting at this portable mahogany writing desk that he carries with him. And he pulls out some paper and a very nice quill pen. And he starts to write these words that almost every American can recite by heart. Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That all men are created equal. They become some of the most famous words in the English language. That they are endowed by their creator with certain certain unalienable rights. That among, these that among these are, are life, life, liberty, liberty and, the and the pursuit of happiness. Life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That's what makes us unique. That's what makes us strong. The shared values that we all hold so dear. But what most Americans don't know is that while he's writing these lofty words for liberation, he had brought with him one of the many enslaved people whom he owned in order to serve him and to keep him comfortable. Now, that enslaved person was a teenager, and that teenager was the half-brother of Thomas Jefferson's wife. What that means is Thomas Jefferson's father-in-law had children with one of the women that he enslaved. So actually, he was Thomas Jefferson's brother-in-law. And so as he's writing these ideals, he knows that they will not apply even to his own family members. At the time that Thomas Jefferson is drafting the Declaration, 150 years have passed since those first Africans were sold into Virginia. The enslaved population has grown from 20 to now 500,000 people. Fully one-fifth of the population is now enslaved. It has grown from a conditional institution where some of those first 20 were able to become free after a term of time to one where Black people are born into it, they die into it, and they pass that status on to their children. You now have generations of Black people who have never known a day of freedom and who will never know a day of freedom. And yet, when Thomas Jefferson's contemporaries talk in public about why the colonists need to be free from England, they refer to themselves as slaves, as slaves to the King of England. And so the colonists are being criticized in newspapers for this obvious duplicity by those who don't believe that they should break off from the British Empire. 
One of them writes, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for freedom from the drivers of Negroes? Another writes to Benjamin Franklin and says, perhaps you should ask the people who are actually enslaved what slavery is like. Thomas Jefferson, of course, is deeply aware of the hypocrisy and aware of the criticism of the hypocrisy. So as he's drafting the Declaration, he includes a passage in there where he actually blames the King of England for introducing slavery into the colonies. He calls slavery a crime. And he says that the King of England committed this crime, but that's not our fault. It was not our doing. This is just one more thing that the King of England did to wrong us. So he brings this document to the Continental Congress. And it doesn't take long before delegates from the Carolinas and from Georgia look at that language about slavery. And one can imagine they said, what the hell are you doing? And they say that there is no way that they are going to sign this document as long as that passage about slavery remains. And so it is struck. And the 13 colonies signed the declaration And the Declaration goes out into the world without mentioning slavery at all. And we start the Revolutionary War. Somehow, miraculously, these 13 scrappy colonies manage to defeat one of the most powerful empires in the world. And we become a new nation. And so the colonists gather and they try to figure out the language that they are going to create in the founding document that we, of course, come to know as the Constitution. But now they have a problem. They were trying to leave behind an old country that they believed was antithetical to freedom and create a new one that they believed would be defined by freedom. This was a country that was going to be based on individual rights, on a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. But this was also a place that at this time was still practicing the institution of slavery. And so the colonists have a choice to make. Are they going to be the country of their ideals, the ideals that they were putting to paper, a country based on the idea that all men were created equal? And if they were going to be that country, then they were going to have to abolish the institution of slavery. Or were they going to be wedded to the institution of slavery because they depended so heavily on the wealth that was being generated from it? And in that case, they can't really write the document that they want to write. And so what they do is they decide that they're going to try to have it both ways. And they bake that contradiction right into the Constitution, both codifying and protecting the institution of slavery, but never actually mentioning the word. And so they have written what is perhaps the most radical constitution in the world. And from the beginning, they knew they were going to violate its most essential principles. They called this new country a democracy, but it wasn't one. 